Well, uh, good morning, SPE. Welcome to Antec, the virtual edition. This is WSPE 79.4, live from Princeton, New Jersey. I'm Jaime Gomez, your president-elect, and I would like to extend a special welcome to all members around the world and our guests. Glad you're here. I wish we had had the opportunity to meet in person in San Antonio. I was really looking forward to being there. But given the circumstances, uh, we're all there and we're all together in spirit. Now, we have a fantastic conference for you this morning. It is my honor and privilege to host four terrific speakers. We are dedicating the day to additive manufacturing or 3D printing, as it's also known. Now, to add some jazz to our conference, I'll be hosting Jaime's Trivia just before we start the afternoon session. So ready your fingers, there will be a few easy questions that you can answer by just pressing one letter in your keyboard to indicate your choice. Now, let me start the morning introducing our first keynote speaker, Dr. Josh Martin. Josh is a mechanical engineer and a material scientist by training. He received uh, his bachelor's degree at the uh, University of uh, Delaware, where he was first exposed to composite materials. Josh worked as a material scientist at the Army Research Labs before moving to Boston. You know, he wanted to get a better accent. Um, then pursued a PhD at the Northeastern University under a National Science Foundation Fellowship. His research, quite interested in, interesting, has spun out into what today is 45, where he operates as the CEO. Josh, we're all ears to listen to you. The floor is yours. Amy, thank you for the generous introduction. I'm going to share my screen and want to thank everybody ahead of time for taking Monday morning to uh, log on to this telecom. So, one moment here. All right. Can, has that already been granted to me, screen share? Yes, sir. Okay. And you can see this full screen here. Perfectly. All set. Great. So um, I'll start by giving a brief introduction of Fortify. Um, as Amy mentioned, we spun out of Northeastern in late 2016 and I have since then gone through a few startup accelerators, uh, namely Mass Challenge, where we're able to take home some non-dilute funding. We have since raised uh, two rounds of venture capital financing in order to commercialize our 3D printing platform, uh, which I'll introduce in a moment. And so we are, we are located out of Boston. If you couldn't tell, I perhaps picked up a little bit of accent, but um, not, as, not as good as it will be in upcoming years. So um, additive manufacturing has provided a lot of promise for reducing some of the manufacturing bottlenecks seen today. And unfortunately, I think a lot of our bottlenecks as far as fragmented supply chain, huge amounts of inertia are really being exposed given the current situation. And if you look at how a part travels across the world, it's pretty mind blowing. Components will be manufactured Oh, question? So you, Sorry, Amy, you're on mute there. Uh, people are not seeing your slides. Are you sure you're uh, sharing the screen? I see. Let me... Just one moment here. click the green button. Thank you. Thanks for your patience there. All right, we're should on. be all good. All right, I'm gonna give people time to just soak this up for a second. Um, and as I said, a lot of the weaknesses in the current supply chain are being exposed given the current situation. It does blow my mind looking at how parts will travel around the world with raw materials um, sourced from almost every continent, lots of primary manufacturing happening in the Far East with uh, parts to be assembled in perhaps Mexico and then distributed around the U.S. for one example. And so 
Uh, I won't spend too much time on this. I know that Ed from HP is going to speak a bit more about hybrid manufacturing and how additive can play into um, more flexible supply chain. And so uh, switching to looking at where additive manufacturing is today, a lot of the uh, advantages here are being able to print complex geometries without the same type of scaling costs you would expect to see in a traditional manufacturing and an ability to distribute manufacturing bandwidth um, versus having consolidated warehouses or um, supply channels around the world. Now, added manufacturing has been around for about three decades and um, this is still um, a vector that we're working towards, this true distributed manufacturing. And I, I believe that one of the main challenges with the industry as a whole is um, the current limited material palette and some um, basic limits around throughput. Now, if you contrast that added manufacturing that is with uh, conventional advanced materials such as composites, uh, which is where a lot of my background is from, um, you'll start to see some, I would say, um, symmetry in the sense that composites or traditional laid up materials are very strong, high performance, whereas a lot of additive materials are rather brittle and weak and typically be used for aesthetic models. Um, however, you don't see the type of uh, complexity for free that you might get from additive in the sense that a lot of tooling and labor intensive steps are required. It takes a long time to um, put an order in for a particular part and have that manufactured. And so really Fortify is coming at the additive manufacturing industry with a composites uh, background looking to combine the best of both worlds here. Uh, how do we get manufacturing flexibility, whether in geometry or supply chain that you would see with additive manufacturing? And how do we leverage advanced material properties that allow for additive to be used in high performance applications? And so in order to do this, we uh, are commercializing what we call the Flux 3D printing platform. What's unique about Fortify is we're taking hybrid materials uh, to additive manufacturing, leveraging the use of engineering grade polymers with different types of functional additives, uh, whether they are metal, ceramic, or elastomeric particles, fibers, et cetera, in order to really change the scope of what's possible using 3D printing. And by using different types of materials, we are able to really change um, the aperture, if you will, of functional properties. And so rather than focusing on parts that are only aesthetically um, viable with perhaps just enough strength or stiffness to uh, perform in a given application, we are able to combine uh, different vectors of material properties, whether it's toughness, wear resistance, electromagnetic properties, thermal performance, such as heat deflection temperature, or even conductivity using unique combinations of additives and functional polymers. And so that's really the, the premise here at Fortify is that neat polymers will only go so far. And if we want to provide a step change in performance beyond what's currently available, uh, we believe that engineering additives are uh, the way to get there, or at least one way. And this is really drawing from the conventional materials supply chain that we have now. If you look at a glass filled nylon, for example, for an injection molding compound, it's uh, almost twice as strong and stiff for uh, high performance applications. And so how do we leverage that? And in this case, um, there are two main components to our platform. Uh, the first is this kinet kin continuous kinetic mixing, which allows us to mix these functional additives with high performance resins on board the system. And so a lot of these material combinations, they're very viscous, they require to be printed at high temperatures or even unique atmospheres, whether it's going to be an inert atmosphere or under pressure. And this system allows for us to handle those materials. And in addition to continuous kinetic mixing, we're also uh, leveraging uh, essentially what my PhD work was focused on called flux print. It's using magnetic alignment to control for fiber architecture and 
Um, anyone with, the, with a background in composites will appreciate this idea that fiber alignment is key to really getting the most out of your performance. And in a traditional composite, if you load the material along the fibers, it'll actually be several times stronger than if you were to load it in a transverse direction. And so this ability to order uh, our alignment really goes a long way. All right, so I'm gonna actually break full screen here because the videos have proven to be challenging in the past. And I hope that you can still see my screen. And so essentially our magnetization technique allows us to coat the surface of essentially any particle we can source, whether it's a ceramic base, metallic base, or some type of polymer. Um, and so we've done a lot of work with carbon fiber, different types of ceramics, such as silicon carbide. And just to show you um, sort of the nature of this response, this is calcium phosphate a um, generally abundant bio uh, compatible ceramic field will be applied. It'll switch. You'll see these particles orient within a fluid medium. And this is just another example. And so we're able to use magnetic fields that are on the order of a refrigerator magnet uh, using this technique to order these particles. So thanks for dealing with that switch there. Now, the, the way that this is applied during our additive manufacturing process is that the continuous kinetic mixing system mixes these treated fibers within a resin. Those fibers are then oriented with an onboard magnetic system. It's essentially surrounding the build area in the systems that you can see behind me. UV light is then used to selectively cure particular voxels effectively programming the alignment in those regions and leaving the adjacent regions to be essentially reprogrammed. And so we can do this uh, several times, practically um, 150,000 times per layer if need be, but have been able to optimize structures within our parts using this system. And so this is generally uh, the point in which I'd pass around some parts for you to see, but uh, in order to compensate for the given workflow, I've taken a picture of this part here. And so um, this is a sample that's printed and reinforced using magnet magnetized carbon fiber. You can see that within each region of the Fortify logo, we have a unique alignment. And this background here actually looks like it's depleted of fiber, but it's only due to the optics of fibers being aligned out of plane and otherwise toward, toward your facing view, um, just to give you a sense of what we can program within a material. Great. So the reason fiber orientation um, happens to be key here, especially with uh, short or chopped fiber, is that we are able to take a page out of nature's book, for example. And if we specifically look at what's often called biosteel or bamboo in this case, you'll see that it's hierarchically ordered over the course of several length scales. And additive manufacturing happens to give us access to some of these regions. It just so happens that using fiber orientation, we can access one more domain. And this is key because a lot of these biocomposites, whether it's bamboo or bone, they exhibit mechanical properties that exceed the sum of their parts. And so they're strong, tough, stiff, light, uh, which is typically considered a mutually exclusive set of material properties. And the goal here is to leverage those type of architectures using additive manufacturing with FlexPrint to achieve higher levels of performance. Okay, and so I might have to pull out of this again, out of the uh, full screen mode. So bear with me one more moment. What we have here uh, is essentially a neat polymer on the left versus a filled and aligned uh, part printed using Fortify. And it's the same resin chemistry. What you'll see on the left here is under about 20 pounds of load. Uh, once the part is jacked up, you'll see very brutal failure. And on the right, using the same resin again, 
uh, but taking advantage of this alignment and reinforcement technique, we we're able to support more than twice the weight. And so we can come back to this in future talk if we want to get more details here. Let's see. Great. So uh, what I'd like to go into next is essentially more of our material palette and how we're using new combinations of functional additives with photopolymers to essentially open up the doors to new and I would say even existing um, verticals that have previously been approached by additive. And so uh, the first one that we've done a, a lot of work with that's I would say very relevant to a time like today is this ability to use ceramic additives to reinforce a high uh, temperature resin. And in this case, we've found um, a lot of traction with injection mold tooling. And so the general concept is that we can reinforce these resins to be tougher, have a higher heat deflection temperature so that they maintain tolerances and leverage the high resolution you get with a light based 3D printing method. And these are these materials are able to shoot much more challenging polymers than uh, other additive tooling solutions. And to give you an idea of um, money and time, we're able to get parts off of this mold uh, essentially ten times faster at a tenth of the cost um, compared to generally manufactured, whether it's cut aluminum or steel or other additive uh, solutions here. And one more example on sort of these tooling textures is if you look at what would typically be required to produce high resolution tools. In some cases, it's more than just a three axis or five axis CNC would provide. Um, you may have to turn to EDM machining, which is very expensive, takes a tremendous amount of time. And that is something that leverages the 3D printing resolution um, where we're able to essentially print these programs and or these textures and contours into our tools um, very effectively and without too much hassle to the user. And one more tooling example, we've done a lot of work with metal injection molding and this process is one where you're shooting very densely filled um, compounds into a mold. This is stainless steel. You essentially have a 55% uh, by volume metal powder within a resin that's injected into these tools. And so it's very uh, abrasive, um, high temperature or high pressures. And that's something that our tooling has been able to provide a lot of value in where um, the users can rapidly iterate on a design without having to cut expensive tooling and wait all the lead time to do so, as well as approach low volume manufacturing. And we've been able to produce thousands of parts off of um, our tools using the Fortified Digital Tooling Resin. And so I mentioned uh, a piece about wear resistance. We have uh, materials now that are being applied into essentially high thermal load, high wear environments. Gears happens to be a particular one and I included this part here because it just demonstrates if you were to get these parts outsourced and, and machined which is typically the way these are made uh, without needing you know a dozen uh, side actions on your tool it's very expensive and a lot of these parts today are being machined out of high performance uh, PEIs class filled um, old tem type of materials and we have a an ability to hit that level of thermomechanical performance again, leveraging uh, this additive manufacturing platform. And using alignment, we can effectively reduce wear um, by an order of two, in this case, based or compared to the neat resin. And that's something we're continuing to push on. And so um, one of the areas that we are most excited at Fortify to expand sort of the scope of applications is looking outside of thermal mechanical performance. Uh, there's, a, I would say, a lot of competing technologies making things stronger and stiffer at temperature. And what's unique about our platform is we can leverage it 
to go into very unique verticals. And so I'd like to just take a little bit of time to speak towards what we're doing in the radio frequency and microwave device space. And um, right now, if you are familiar with RF devices, perhaps you're, you've heard of phase array technology versus passive uh, beam steering. Um, long story short here is in order to direct uh, high frequency signal, the traditional um, way of doing it is, is quite expensive and it uses very complicated semiconductor arrays. And there's a field within the RF industry right now looking at passive dielectric lensing. And so we're able to use our 3D printing platform here, again, with unique materials to print these refractive structures that can take a signal and concentrate it to a very uh, specific point, which is important if you're looking at millimeter wave or 5G uh, types of antennas. If you look at a lot of the IoT industry or even automotive sensing, and these are types of structures that you really can't manufacture any other way but additive. And in order for them to be effective, they require uh, very unique materials that can't be manufactured on any other system. And so I have sort of a exploded unit cell here of one of these parts. And some of these features, if you can see on my screen, essentially in, in the center, they get down to just 100 microns or so. And um, printing that on another system turns out to be quite challenging. And what's exciting about this space is if you look at where our material performance is granting access, we're able to produce parts that are uh, very low in terms of dielectric or loss tangent. And in other words, they don't um, interfere with signal uh, and have a wide range of dielectric constants that we can manufacture using this unique combination of resin and, in this case, ceramic additives. And so uh, the status quo right now on this left end here is to 3D print these devices with extrusion-based methods. And, you know, these are high surface area contours. It takes a long time, for sure. It takes several days, in, in essence, to print a, a large lens. And that's something that Fortify can use our light-based platform to manufacture in a number of hours. And so it's significantly faster, higher performance, higher resolution using our platform here. And if you want to see some interesting applications, the reason this is so unique is that additive can be used to control the effective contour of a beam that's being transmitted through one of these devices. And there's tremendous applications in automotive radar where there are dozens of sensors on any given vehicle that can be condensed down to just a handful of printed devices. And I would say um, extremely relevant to today's number of telecoms within the 5G market, the amount of base stations and small cells that need to be deployed in order for residential communities, commercial areas to actually have access to 5G is just tremendous. And these devices are traditionally very expensive. And you know we're gonna need them every 100 feet or so because these uh, 5G millimeter wave signals don't penetrate walls very well. And in order to scale an infrastructure like that using the expensive semiconductor arrays available today, that's, you know, that's a lot of investment. And being able to print these devices at a fraction of the cost and by changing just the design, you'll be able to control the contour of these signal pathways, it, it's a very unique um, advantage. Okay, and so um, just to zoom out again, um, you know, the key point I wanted to make here is that by using unique engineering polymers and functional additives, we're able to take additive manufacturing into new types of applications. Um, that we aren't able to achieve, uh, or at least we have not been able to achieve in the past decade. And one of the areas I wanted to talk through is this ceramic matrix material space. And um, this is a, I would say a different type of polymer in this case, we're using a pre-ceramic uh, that's in conjunction or partnership with HRL labs. And the unique piece here 
is that these polymers, which are photosensitive, can be um, run through pyrolysis up to 1200 degrees C, and they essentially degrade into a ceramic matrix. And so we're able to take the very same platform that we use to print ceramic reinforced polymers and use that to print ceramic reinforced ceramic matrices. And so uh, CMCs, they're uh, generally the highest performing class of material, which is why they're traditionally very expensive and leveraged primarily for the aerospace sector. And with this, we're able to not only introduce another uh, level of complexity with part design, but also uh, democratize this for a lot of applications that would otherwise been prohibited from using these due to the cost of these materials. And so um, the target of this work is really hitting a class of material that can perform above uh, even nickel super alloys in terms of temperature and mechanical properties. In other words, you can use these parts to print a, a crucible and melt some uh, stool, steels and aluminum, for example. Um, and we're looking to take these unique materials into high temperature wear resistant components such as valves and, and pumps, especially if you look across um, something that might be in an industrial process that moves a lot of uh, abrasive material at temperature in a very corrosive environment. It's a perfect fit for these materials, um, printed abrasives themselves, and even automotive and aerospace fuel injector nozzles. Um, this is what a lot of this work has been funded to to date um, at HRL to support, which is essentially printed CMC micro launch rocket nozzles. And so this really speaks to the level of performance that can be reached uh, using this class of material. And using flux print in this case, we are able to reinforce these ceramics to maximize toughness, which is essentially the bane of any technical ceramics existence. And so um, that's something that we are very excited to uh, release to the industry. Okay, and so um, some key summaries from this session are that the additive manufacturing industry provides a way of de-risking supply chains Again, I know that Ed from HP is going to speak a bit more on how hybrid manufacturing methods can uh, help with the current supply chain risks. And in this case, the material selection through additive is one of the, the main limitations for the industry reaching um, true manufacturing abilities. And that's something that Fortify is looking to address using functional additives with our continuous kinetic mixing system and our flux print or magnetic alignment so that we can introduce a new set of materials for industrial applications. And so you can find out more at the website. Um, in addition, you can also drop me a note and I'll be able to connect you with the right person within Fortify. Okay. Hey, hey, there we go. Yeah, now I, you know, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you so much. You know, this is a, a, a wonderful presentation. I'm fascinated and intrigued about the potential applications that you may encounter you know, with this uh, uh, technology. Uh, as you and I discussed uh, Saturday, you know, my background is also in composite materials and it seems like the bar has been moved uh, very high nowadays with what you can achieve, achieve you know, with this um, uh, multi-material. So while I give uh, time to the audience, please uh, uh, sharpen your knives and, you know, type in your questions in, you know, in the chat, you know, while people are doing that, you know, let me, let me start with a, a question, you know, of, of my own. You know, I noticed in, in one of your pictures, you know, you have this reservoir where you're mixing, you know, the, uh, uh, um, the additives, you know, and perhaps a thermoplastic and all that. Sometimes for us, it's difficult to go from micro level to macro level and try to scale up properties. You mentioned, and I noticed that a refrigerator size magnet, how, how strong of a feel is needed to align these particles? And are, can these parts uh, have any uh, uh, bulk uh, magnetic properties? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, let me just zoom out and 
go to an earlier part of the talk here to better speak through this. There we go. And so let me see. The, the first question you had is, you know, just how strong is the field? In this case, the, the field that is being used to manipulate these particles is actually, when I say order of magnitude strength of refrigerator magnet, that means that it's within the tens of gauss. Um, and so, you know, one Tesla is 10 to the negative four gauss. And so we're orders of magnitude beneath what you would experience within, for example, an MRI. Um, one of the things that's unique about this technique is if you look at the fibers here, there's not a lot of magnetic material there. We're just peppering the surface of whatever additive of choice. And therefore, when you look at the bulk composite, like these parts themselves, they have less than 0.1% by volume magnetic material and have exhibit no bulk response. So you could put these parts within an MRI and you would not exhibit any type of uh, movement or mo magnetic moment, if you will. Great. Uh, uh, a question that I got from the audience here is, can you use the uh, metal particles to enhance uh, heat transfer in additive manufacturing and, and particularly improve that you know, layer to layer uh, adhesion? I see. So the first part of the question, yes. Um, we've had some baseline experiments that show we can take what's traditionally a thermal conductivity of 0.3 watt per meter Kelvin um, and improve that by more than 10x. And that is based on using orientation to reduce the percolation threshold, get thermal conductivity um, to increase, especially in a particular direction. And that's something that is also, I would say, seen in uh, electrical conductivity, for example. And so, you know, we, we use steel flake to uh, essentially turn on the conductivity using alignment in regions you'll see something that's um, on order with electrostatic discharge level of surface resistance sheet resistance uh, in some areas you'll see something that is perhaps even higher or lower based on the amount of fiber we use and in terms of using that between the layers in this case um, i imagine that we can leverage that for more effective thermal post processing uh, there's a better heat transfer. You can more effectively get heat through the middle of the part. Um, but that's not something that we've looked at too closely. It's definitely an interesting way to approach it. Okay. I, I'm just curious about something. You've mentioned high temperatures, you know, uh, uh, extremely high temperatures. And I'm looking at something that is more, you know, down to earth for, for us plastics engineers, like, you know, mm -hmm. plus fiber reinforced polyamides, for example. You know, okay. can you use this technology with something like, you know, as, as simple as e-glass reinforced nylon? You can. Um, so we have done a lot of work with e-glass. I don't believe it's addressed in this presentation, but if you go to the site, you'll see <clears throat> that some of our uh, tough materials are e-glass reinforced. Um, you know, as far as high temperature goes, this class of material that's shown here or here, if you will, this goes up to about 280 degrees Celsius, which mm -hmm. it has been really tuned for a lot of under the hood applications. If you think about automotive, it's, you know, maybe 120 in the at max um, around the engine components, you know, different types of brackets, intake manifolds, for example. Uh, that's something that we are able to find a lot of application in and uh, on that note, we do a lot of work with connectors for under the hood applications. And this is, this may look familiar to some folks. Uh, if you have an electric vehicle, you'll be familiar with this type of port. Um, we're doing a lot of work by printing electrical connectors. If you think about the complexity of tooling required to make a part like this and compare that to say Tesla, who last year produced only a few hundred thousand units you know, making an investment in that tooling is potentially a million dollars just to produce a couple hundred thousand parts. And that's something that we're uh, targeting as an end use part application for us. There is a question, uh, actually, since you're measuring the tooling, uh, there's a question about the tooling as to, you know, how durable, you know, uh, you know the, the mold, for example, you know, how many shots can be produced 
with a kind of tooling that, that is produced with this you know, technology? Sure. So we've, um, let me just, I'm going to see if you can see this part. So this is a, this is one of our internal feature checks. Um, what this demonstrates is an ability to shoot uh, high, high embossed features. Mm -hmm. And a part like this, is, it's pretty challenging. It's not, it's not an easy part to shoot. And we've done over a thousand of these um, before shutting the machine down. And as far as robustness of the tool goes, it does matter what you're shooting, how complex is the geometry, but a good rule of thumb is a few hundred into a thousand or two. Uh, we have plans to push this into several thousand so that it can be used as a bridge to eliminate the need for uh, soft tooling or aluminum based tooling. And if you look at the medical space where there are are a lot of SKUs and in some cases with low volume. That's something that um, a tool like this would be really well positioned to address. Yeah, Josh. You know, let's stay with tooling for a second. You know, has cooling been able to, uh, be, been incorporated? You know, uh, just to reduce the uh, the longer cycle times. Uh, uh, you know, for for a molded part. Sure, that's something we've done a little bit of experimenting with. Uh, to be honest, a lot of the customers we work with today are looking to get parts on the order of hundreds of units. Um, and so that cycle time, reducing it from, you know, 30 seconds down to 20 seconds is not necessarily a huge um, motivator. In this case, it's not the rate limiting step or rate limiting factor. If we were producing hundreds of thousands, it certainly would be. And so that's something we stand to do more work on. And um, someone had mentioned or asked a question about if we could improve thermal conductivity. And that's one of the main motivators driving that work is how can we uh, essentially increase the conductivity of these tools so that they release heat uh, at a faster clip and have a positive effect on cycle time. Okay, let's go back a little bit to uh, uh, magnetic alignment. Okay, is it possible uh, uh, for FDM uh, 3D printing uh, do you have any experiences, for, uh, for example, to address the uh, interlayer uh, adhesion? That's a very good question. Um, that's actually where I first started uh, my PhD efforts on. Um, it turns out, let me see if I can get this image up. It turns out that in a thermoplastic, melt thermoplastic, you have a tremendous amount of high viscosity material, which means you have a lot of shear forces, a lot of shear torque that you have to overcome. And long answer, uh, I don't believe that that's a very viable path because in extrusion-based, FDM-based, you'll see a lot of shear dominated alignment. Uh, there's been a lot of, a few groups that have done tremendous work. Uh, Jennifer Lewis's lab has done a lot of work uh, characterizing how shear flow affects fibers while they're extruding from a nozzle. Um, and so that was an area that we first explored and found that within a uh, photopolymer due to the low viscosity, relative low viscosity of the resins, we can get much more effective alignment. Okay, I, I have, uh, I'm, I'm looking now at our time, we still have uh, time for a few questions. So I have two philosophical questions that would be uh, towards the end. Uh, sure. But uh, let's go back to, you were showing some CMC machines so you were talking about different axes. Do you see any improvement in uh, Z direction uh, tensile properties compared to other 3D printing technologies? We do actually. In fact, we see a, let me see where this data is in here. Um, I put this slide in here to show that by using what's called a cholesteric orientation. In other words, every layer, um, excuse me one sec, every layer has a unique pattern to it. We are able to improve the strength in the Z versus the knee, uh, which is interesting. Uh, we're able to drive it up by about 30 to 35 percent. Okay, uh, it seems like some of the questions came through a, a different chat that I'm, I'm monitoring now, but uh, um, this question, uh, I had it since yesterday, you know, that we, we, we were discussing, you know, you, you showed this reservoir, you showed particles, you showed the uh, 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 thermoplastic, you know, resin. 
what is the maximum ratio you were talking about uh, you know very high viscosity high temperatures in order to handle this mm -hmm. what is the maximum uh, let's call it you know loading capacity of these kind of particles in in the system you have right um i wish i could give you a very binary or discrete answer it it's a, a function of how long or what's the, what's the surface area of your particles. If they have a really high aspect ratio, your system will get more viscous much more rapidly. Um, just to give you a few examples, if we look at what we're doing in, for example, this RF space, these materials are essentially half by volume um, additive. And so it's pretty high loading. And we're talking about viscosity that's in like the you know, almost 10,000 um, centipoids regime. It's like honey. Um, and so if we look at some of these other examples, you know, these high wear resistant materials, we have a, an additive package that's closer to 15 to 20% by volume. And it turns out that that's actually where things get much more challenging from a, a suspension point of view. You know, if your system is super high viscosity, additives will stay a bit more uh, suspended for longer. But if you have something that's in that five to 20, you're still looking at a very low viscosity resin with a very high density additive. And that's where our uh, CKM system really shines. Got it. Good. Uh, two, more, uh, two more questions. Last two questions. Uh, uh, one is coming about the qualification certification challenges regarding using uh, uh, printed soft tooling versus you know, printing the part itself? Right. So printed soft tooling versus printing the part itself. What's, let me try to take a few angles at this question. Uh, one of the things that's interesting for us is that we provide a value proposition, at least to the customers we're working with from a validation perspective, because groups in the past have had challenges taking a part that's 3D printed and using that as a proxy for how a molded part would actually perform. In other words, groups want to prototype and evaluate as far as a QA perspective goes, the part that's made out of the end use material by the end use manufacturing method. And printing tooling gets you there. You can actually mold your part. We can go from design to molded parts in about 30 hours. And while you might be able to print those same parts in the same amount of time, between the process itself, you have all these layer lines, your material is not exactly the same. It's the same base thermoplastic, but it's not exactly the same. That's um, been challenging for some of our groups from a um, qualification perspective. And let me just show something back here. In regards to uh, using soft tooling, we did some work with TTH out of Ohio, they've molded, uh, it's actually over 300 shots of this acetyl blend. Uh, they found that these tools were able to maintain their dimensional tolerance um, within the same uh, scope as their metal tools within inventory. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we're uh, excited about. You know, reinforcing these resins means that we're getting lower CTE, we're getting higher heat deflection temperature, these tools are just more robust and able to maintain their tolerance. Since, you know, we're gravitating now towards, you know, por uh, polymeric materials with the kind of audience, you know, we have, that's, that's normal. Uh, yes, no answer. Have you worked with uh, polypropylene? Yeah, uh, uh, from a molding perspective, this is, this is, oh, can't really see what's back room. This is polypro. We've done a lot of work with polypro. We've done a lot of work with PVC, acetyl, POM, uh, ABS, even glass filled nylon, polycarbonate. Looking okay. to build that portfolio uh, out. A, a daring question is, you know, what kind of magnetic particles, if you can share with uh, with the audience, or that's proprietary? Sure, it's actually so it's patented. Um, the, I would say the workhorse force particle we use is iron oxide, uh, Fe three hundred four. It's great at that low length scale. Not only is it super cheap but it's also paramagnetic, which means when you take away a magnetic field source, it doesn't exhibit magnetic response. We've done work with other types of magnetic compounds, um, cobalt, for example, and I would say that that's more in the proprietary domain, but for the most part, we're, we're leveraging rust, if you will. 
Okay, let, let me talk about durability. You get a, uh, a part that has been 3D printed. You have a, a part that has been done by traditional you know, methods. Do you expect longer lifetimes for these complex parts due to lower residual uh, stress? Yes. Um, and so a couple ways to take that, I guess, versus a thermoplastic, um, you know, there's, from a longevity perspective, we're doing a lot of testing now. Uh, certainly versus most thermosets, um, we feel that we're at an advantage, especially 3D printed thermosets because uh, these additives work as a light absorber. They're not necessarily going to allow your part to age from UV uh, as quickly. From stress concentrations, there's, this might be a good slide to speak to. There's um, a lot of very interesting fundamental uh, science that we're pulling out and with our collaborators at Northeastern University, I, uh, forgive me, I did not add their reference here. We're seeing um, this really impressive ability to improve toughness, which leads to, you know, how do you mitigate against residual stresses, against micro cracks from growing, and how do you make your parts more robust? And this is what we believe is one of the main reasons why our printed tooling outperforms some of other options is because these aligned fibers will effectively stop cracks um, from, from spreading and lead to more robust materials. Uh, Josh, a um, couple of questions from the audience are, uh, of course, on the, the future of uh, hybrid materials, polymer science, you know, uh, uh, which is, you know, what we care about, you know, uh, really understanding plastics, uh, um, the, the future applications they have, et cetera, et cetera. Let, let me throw you a curveball here. With everything that's going on uh, with you know, COVID-19, you know, we should be having this uh, conversation live mm -hmm. in, in San Antonio. How can your technology uh, help um, humanity in this case? You know, it's not about a country. It's not about you know, a, a particular region. It's, you know, we're all in this you know, uh, uh, situation together. Yeah. Can your technology help in any way, shape, or form uh, with uh, you know, equipment, with uh, parts, uh, um, what, what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that we have spent a lot of time um, on recently. And I actually have a few pictures here to speak to what, we're, what Fortify's COVID response team is doing. Um, I'm sure most people are aware that there is a PPE shortage. A lot of that comes down to um, some of the supply chain challenges that we spoke to in the beginning of the talk. Um, and so, you know, Fortify is working closely with a nonprofit in the Boston area, which was actually founded by a few of the 3D printing companies coming together called Mask On. And the major mission here is to take off the shelf <clears throat> head scuba masks and retrofit those with a generally abundant filter um, using additive manufacturing. So these parts here are printed using form labs. Uh, Fortify believes that, you know, the next step is to mold these. And so what we've done and we've been working through the weekend is to print tools, get parts molded, get those parts validated so that we can slingshot these components into production on the order of hundreds of thousands using injection mold tools. And we believe that the digital tooling resin is a big part of that. Um, and really just want to accelerate time to parts at scale uh, as much as we can. And so, you know, this group's done a lot of really great work. They've sourced over 80,000 masks. The plan is to protect up to a million healthcare uh, providers using their technology, using this method. And that's something that Fortify is really working diligently on. Um, one of the other pieces of the PP shortage happens to be test swabs. Turns out um, there's a lot of really good energy 3D printing these swabs directly. Uh, there seems to be uh, some hesitation in terms of adoption because of the risk of getting a positive negative or, or a, excuse me, a false negative or positive test using a printed swab. And so Fortify is working with um, Brigham Williams or Women's Health Hospital to actually mold these test swabs using nylon and then having those um, in conjunction with a partner flocked, which is essentially the, the traditional way of manufacturing these. And, being able to do this quickly is something that uh, additive really shines at right now. Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, 
just to kind of draw attention. In fact, the, this nonprofit is well funded, so I meant to remove this donation ask, but I will say, um, look into their website if, if that's something they're asking for. As far as what the community uh, today could really help with raw materials from um, especially generally used thermoplastics for the medical space is something that um, Fortify itself is looking to source more of for molding compounds and especially this melt blown polymer filter material. If there's anybody in the audience that knows somebody that might have uh, traditional manufacturing techniques to produce filter media, that's definitely a, a need right now. Um, the NIH has uh, released some stopgap 3D printed designs. So this mask is, is on the NIH 3D print exchange, can be 3D printed. However, it's part of 3D print, um, you know, a NIOS H or 3M N95 style respirator. Uh, so having that polymer blown filtration media is really important. And the last thing I'll say, um, just to highlight why uh, so many groups are applying pressure here, is just that um, the largest N95 mask manufacturer in North America is 3M. They're gearing up to produce 50 million masks each month by June. They're about at 38 million per month right now. And just to give a sense of scale, a single New York City hospital goes through about a million masks a month um, with the current ramp rating. There are a lot of hospitals in the U.S. And so this is something that is going to require a tremendous amount of attention. Uh, no effort, well, I think, will be unleveraged in this case. So that's something we're, we're pushing on. Gosh, thanks. Incredible. Uh, um, <clears throat> please, uh, uh, one last word for our audience uh, that, again, you know, um, are more oriented towards you know, polymers and, and, and plastics. Um, any last word on the future of polymer science and this technology? What should people be researching on, doing, looking for new materials? You know, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, from the, the four or five perspective, we're really excited about taking materials that might be very expensive to source today. I mean, I'd mentioned some of the glass filled PEI, for example, or specialty compounds that um, might be used in the electrical space, those materials are usually some mixture of polymer with an additive, functional additive. And if that's something that um, groups are working with, Fortify wants to partner with material suppliers to bring some of these to the additive manufacturing space. And I'd say that's that's one thing to keep in mind is, you know, using these advanced platforms, we can take materials that couldn't be 3D printed before and, um, make them out of the manufacturable. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think it was a terrific presentation, Josh. Uh, on behalf of the Society of Plastic Engineers, I want to thank you for uh, volunteering your time and contributing to uh, uh, advance uh, um, our knowledge of 3D printing. Normally, we would give you a round of applause. So there it goes. It's virtual for you. Uh, so uh, people applauding from uh, uh, many parts of the world. And uh, with this, uh, we have about seven minutes break. Is that correct, uh, you know, from uh, uh, headquarters? So if that is so, you know, we could play some uh, music and we'll reconvene exactly at 10 o'clock. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time.
しました。I may please unmute yourself if you need to. Oh, okay. Should I start the introduction again? Yes, please. Okay, very good. Uh, let's turn to our next speakers. Uh, I'm sorry I was in mute. Uh, it is actually a combo, that's right. You get two for the price of one. Uh, Mr. Edward Davis from Hewlett Packard. Edward has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Michigan State University. Uh, and was also in the executive management master program at the University of California, San Diego. Edward has over 30 years experience in printing technology investigations <clears throat> and product development, including over 10 years driving Hewlett Packard strategy in 3D printing and digital manufacturing. Edward current responsibility is translating mega trends, I love that word, and competitive analysis into the vision for the digital manufacturing industry and developing the execution strategy for creating this manufacturing ecosystem all the way from design you know, through production and final use. Edward has a proven ability to take complex technical concepts into impactful marketing messages. He has also shown digital manufacturing technology and industry experience driving the invention of multi-jet fusion technology uh, and evangelizing Hewlett Packard's investment in leading the industry. I'm also very pleased to introduce his co-presenter, Mr. Jesse Lee from GoProto. Um, as president of the company, Jesse is focused on bringing world-class customer service, communication tools, and manufacturing technologies to Grotto's client partners. Jesse is a 22 year veteran of the rapid manufacturing industry, developing partnership level relationships with clients along the way. He leads GoProto sales and manufacturing organization with a passion for the power of smart people using great tools. Edward and Jesse, the floor is yours. Thanks, Amy. I'm gonna to try to share my screen now. Does everybody hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we're going to talk about <clears throat> hybrid uh, manufacturing, the use of both 3D printing and analog. Um, but to set the tone, I actually need to explain the, the direct part market space. So unlike Josh, who is you know, talking uh, a lot about making the molds themselves, we'll be talking about the direct part market space first. Um, then we'll get into the program manager needs. And here I need to maybe apologize a little bit. I'm, I'm not a material scientist. I'm not a plastics engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. So I'll be talking from a, from a personal uh, customer experience, you know, what we're looking for from processes and, and plastics. If we get to Q&A and people ask me materials questions, I hope Josh is still on the line and he can help me out here. Um, then we'll get into the hybrid uh, and then we're going to get into uh, proactively talking about some of the some of the things that we're doing to to help with the with the COVID response. So actually, let me start my video. Also, Ed so, Edward, yes, I was going to ask. Uh, okay, how I want to see you. All right, how's that look? Kind of center myself. Good. Yeah, All right, good. cool. So with that, let's uh, let's move forward. Um, let's see. All right, so first and foremost, just to uh, kind of break things down, I've listed the, the typical product development cycle and broke that into different phases, the design phase, or often called the investigation phase, the development phase, and then production. Now, I call this the design phase because in fact, what I wanna do is correct some uh, fallacies in the 3D print industry. And so I've called it the design phase on purpose because what I want to do is correct the fallacy that you can go from design to production. We've all heard that phrase. The beauty of 3D printing is you can go from design to production. Fact of the matter is the only time you can go from design to production is if you have no quality requirements. 
If you have quality requirements, you have to go through a development phase. And what happens in that development phase is that the people on the demand side, the mechanical engineers like myself, tune the design to the process we have in mind and the people on the process side tune the process to the parts. And that always happens if you have quality requirements. Now, the reason you can't skip that for any processes in particular for thermoplastic is, is the following relationship. That part quality is a function of the thermal history of the details of the part, which is a function of the part itself and it is a function of the process settings. So you can't get around this. Very specifically, dimensional error is related to the, the, uh, the thermal history of the part, which is related to the thermal stresses within the part, which is related to the part geometry. So there's no getting around the development phase. You have to go through a development phase if you have quality requirements. And so this is one of these fallacies that I'm trying to correct uh, in, in the industry. And in fact, for HP, what we've done is for the part designers, we've published a, what we call the MJF engineering handbook so that the designers like myself understand what are the rules that you need to follow for this particular MJF process. And then on the, on the supply side, we've come up with a process control software that allows people who are process engineers to tune the process to the specific batch or part that you have in mind. So these sorts of solutions when you have quality requirements are gonna be are gonna be necessary regardless of whether it's MJF or any other any other process. Okay. So then this is gonna be a complicated looking slide, but I'm not gonna go through it. What happens in the design phase is that these are the personas that are uh, involved in this product life cycle from left to right. By persona, I mean the marketing definition of persona. What I mean is that somebody has a specific uh, job. Uh, specification. The mechanical engineer in this investigation phase or design phase is not designing parts. What they're doing is designing the functionality of a product. I'm talking about multiple part products. And when Lisa, our mechanical engineer, gets into the development phase, she breaks that functionality, that product functionality into parts with the help of somebody that's going to help her with design for manufacturing rules and in this case, we're calling that persona, uh, Laura, the supply chain engineer or supply chain manager. At the same time, Lisa breaks that functionality into assembly processes with Jorge, the manufacturing engineer. So since we're talking about part manufacturing, I wanna focus on this conversation between Lisa and Laura. What happens when they're breaking this product functionality into uh, manufacturable parts? It, it's a very simple conversation. And it goes something along these lines. For a given production volume, that's the that's the basis. You know, if you're if you're going to make a hundred parts, or you're going to make uh, ten thousand products, or you're going to make a million products. For a given production volume, pick pick the least expensive combination of process materials that meets Lisa's needs. And in this case, Lisa has two requirements for multiple part products. The first is dimensional tolerances, and the second is that she gets the material property she, that she's looking for. Now, this is not a, not a one-way conversation. It's normally an iterative process. And uh, what tends to happen is that Laura is defending cost and Lisa is defending functionality. Because if the product doesn't function, Lisa gets in, in trouble. And if the product doesn't meet the cost, well, Laura gets in trouble. So what I wanna do then is, is show a market space where we tie together dimensional tolerance, and least expensive combination of process and material. So in the following slides, I'm going to attempt to put um, the different processes on a market frame, on a direct part market frame. And unfortunately, it's a two-dimensional uh, two page. And I'm going to try to fit three dimensions. But what's missing from there is, for example, the materials property. But what you see then is the following. Now. I'm going to speak in broad generalities, and uh, I'm actually going to try to be provocative. There's always exceptions to generalities, and, and I'll accept that. Whenever we choose uh, our engineering paths, the truth of the matter is what we're choosing is what problems we want to deal with. So on this market frame, I'm also going to talk about the economic or technology challenges 
that put the different technologies in the different space. All right, ready for this? The kind of a little bit complicated frame, but the horizontal axis is the least expensive process for a given production volume. The vertical axis is this dimensional tolerance where the bottom are bad tolerances, the top are very good tolerances. Now, just for fun, I added a third axis over on the, over on the right-hand side. Simple complexity is towards the top, complex is towards the bottom. Now, there's no real relation between the uh, dimension of tolerances and the complexity, but this frame is going to make more sense when I explain the challenges of why uh, different technologies are in different spaces here. Now, what I mean by this is thermoplastic direct part manufacturing. This is different than what Josh was talking about, where, where he's talking about possibly uh, using his technology to replace aluminum in molds or replace soft steel in molds. So here we go. The technology and economic challenges that put these different processes in their place. Of course, aluminum molds, if you run them and run them and run them, the mold begins to wear. And so at some point, the curve just starts to fall off on you and your quality starts to drop. The fact of the matter is aluminum in and of itself does not get you great, great tolerances because it doesn't have the thermal capacity necessary uh, to maintain an even temperature uh, across the mold. Even if you put a lot of work into the cooling system, it's very difficult. So if you need higher manufacturing volumes or you need better quality, you tend to go to soft steel molds. Now soft steel, same thing happens. It's soft, you know, after, you know, a lot of shots, but after some shots, it starts to fall apart on the, on the right. Everybody knows these things take weeks to, to qualify. You have to design the mold. You have to do trial one, trial, trial zero, trial one, trial two, uh, center the processes. So it's time consuming and expensive, which means it doesn't scale going to the left. What I mean to say is if you're only going to make a thousand of a product, you're probably not going to invest in a soft steel mold. And then again, up at the top, um, there's some, some problems with very, very high quality uh, for these soft steel molds uh, because of pressure limitations. So I would go through this, but you guys know this as well as I do. Generally speaking, you're gonna take uh, 10 to uh, maybe 20 weeks to complete the trial zero, trial one, two, and then center the molds. So you guys know this better than me. This is what makes uh, soft steel mold uh, an expensive process for low man, low volume manufacturing. Now, hard steel molds, um, they don't scale going to the left uh, for the same reason. It's actually more difficult to make these uh, more complicated and it's harder to machine the hard steel. And then I'm gonna comment on this towards the end. Um, molding actually allows you to do some pretty complex geometries, but not that complex. And so we'll comment on that towards the end. Manual machining, of course, it, you can get some pretty good tolerances, but the fact of the matter is uh, towards the top, the, the guy stops with his ability to pay attention. And if he machines too much material off, you can't go backwards and it's labor intensive. So it doesn't scale very well going, uh, going to, to, to the right. So program machining, CNC machining, fact of the matter is you get great tolerances, absolute great tolerances. This is not a thermal process unless you're machining too fast, right? And so you can get some absolutely phenomenal uh, dimensional tolerances from CNC. Um, the problem is it doesn't scale very well going to the right because what happens is in particular for complex geometries, it just isn't cost effective. Now, what it does is very simple geometries and very high manufacturing volumes. And an example could be something like precision gears where you can make, you can make tens of thousands per year and in a cost-effective manner. So then what happens if you have the requirements of a CNC, but uh, the, the tolerance requirements of a CNC, but the geometry is too complex to effectively produce with a CNC, there's this space that I'm calling CNC hybrid, which is effectively make the complex geometry with a mold, bring it up to the CNC machine down, the extreme tolerances. We do this on, on our pen datums for our, um, for our 2D print and for our 3D print. Um, 
for the thing to actually align really well with the printer itself, the datum has ridiculous tolerances, such tolerances that you could never mold it effectively. We leave too much material on those datums. We injection mold most of the most of the geometry. We take it to the CNC and we machine down the, the datums. Well, so since this talk is about additive manufacturing, of course, I need to talk about additive manufacturing. So these different spaces. Light processing of photopolymers is here, and I mean direct manufacture of parts. I don't mean making molds, and I mean pure photopolymers, not the composite materials and the and the mixed materials that Josh was talking about. Um, laser centering and 3D extrusion down at the lower left, and I'll explain why these are in these different spaces in, in the following. Of course, um, the light processing it's not a thermal process, it's, it's, it's a chemical process. You guys know this better than I do. Of course, you don't get differential thermals. What you get is differential shrinking. And so you get some pretty good tolerances, but you can't get great tolerances because of differential shrinkage. These tend to be made in small batches because of the, uh, because of the singular layer batch that you can do. So it doesn't scale real well going to the right because of small, small batching. And then generally speaking, these, these photopolymers, uh, a lot of times the light processing with these rigid platforms, they have limited geometries. And so they don't actually scale into the prototyping space uh, because of these limited geometries. Material extrusion, they have a difficult time scaling to the right because of what I call a low ratio of productivity divided by acquisition costs. What I mean to say is, if you buy a $300,000 machine of material extrusion and you can make 500 parts a year with it, well, the fact of the matter is if you have production volumes of 5,000, you have to buy 10 dedicated machines at $300,000 a piece and you, no, no mold in the world costs that much money. So they have a hard time scaling to the right because of this ratio, not because of productivity alone, not because of acquisition costs alone, but because of the ratio. And then, scaling to the to uh, better tolerance they actually have a trade-off between what they choose the the um the bore diameter for that extrusion is a trade-off between do you want to go fast or do you want to have fine detail if you got a big bore you can go really fast but you got terrible detail if you have a very small bore you can get great detail but you have terrible productivity and this is, this is algebra, right? If you wanna control two things on the output, you, you need at least two input variables and they have one input variable while they have a single uh, diameter bore. And so they're forced into a trade-off and they, they've picked a point which is not terrible detail, not terrible productivity, somewhere in between. So then having said that, what, we've done is uh, in fact looked at powder bed fusion. For those of you who are not familiar with multi-jet fusion, I'm gonna introduce laser centering first because what we've done is taken some of the, the trade-offs of laser centering and improved upon them. So laser centering, it's the same problem scaling to the right. It's a point process and they have a low ratio of productivity divided by acquisition cost. They're a bit faster than material extrusion uh, but the fact of the matter is the same same story. If you if you have to buy a three hundred thousand dollar machine that can make one or two thousand parts a year, well, clearly scaling that to twenty thousand is 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 a challenge, right? You you might as well invest in a mold. And then they've got a different trade off moving up, but it's the same algebra. If you want to control both um, both accuracy and you wanna control the Z property, you need two input variables and all they have is on off. So let me explain that with a picture and then I'll introduce multi-jet fusion. So in this picture, the horizontal is X or Y, it doesn't matter which, the vertical is Z. Uh, the bottom uh, portion here is, the, is one layer and this top portion is the next layer. The weakest point in all of these layering processes is between layers. Okay, it always is the weakest point. What happens with laser centering is that you blast the laser into the uh, into this powder bed, um, and uh, you try to melt where you want the thing to melt. Now, the fact of the matter is, the laser only penetrates into the layer about 10 microns, 
and the layer thickness is about 100 microns. And so you literally depend on, you literally depend on uh, thermal conductivity to get good bonding between the layers. Now, of course, if you've got this thermal conductivity in the Z direction, because you want good bonding, you also have thermal conductivity in the X and Y. And so there's a trade-off between getting a good property in the Z and the detail that you can get in the X and Y, right? And there's no way to control that, um, at least in their current implementation. So multi-jet fusion is very similar. We lay down uh, a, a layer of powder, we melt. We lay down another layer of material, we melt. And what we do, in fact, is we put down a fusing agent. And the fusing agent, um, to be honest, it only penetrates uh, somewhere between 30 and 50 microns into that layer. And then we apply energy. And then, of course, we depend on thermal conductivity in the Z direction to get good melting as well, right? And we get better melting and we get better penetration in the Z. And so people say, well, then you've got a problem with X and Y, right? Not quite, because in fact, what we do is we put detailing agent where we want to stop the, the fusing from happening. And that detailing agent effectively helps us get a thermal profile that looks more vertical. And so to control both the detail in X and Y and good isotropic properties, we have two agents, a fusing agent and a detailing agent. And this is how we've invented around the, the, the problems with laser centering. So with that, we're actually able to get some very good dimensional tolerances. We've done our own internal studies. Um, there's a different talk I can give, but um, in fact, what we do, if, for those of you who are familiar with the scale, we can attain an I, inter, international tolerance grade 13 with a CPK of 1.33. Which is similar to the tolerances you can get with soft steel molding. You can get much better tolerances with with hard steel molding, but it's very similar to what you can get with soft steel molding. Um, whereas uh, we've done our own internal tests on SLS and extrusion, and they're more along the lines of IT 1516. So what we attempt to do then is to take some market from CNC over in this zone because we're actually more cost effective than CNC in this zone and take some market from the parts you might get from soft steel molds right here. Now, that's for normal geometries. That's for geometries that you can mold. There's some additional things that you can do with 3D printing, which is to print things which can't be molded. So, ah, I've hidden that slide. I lost that slide. I'm going to actually go back, grab a portion of that slide. Allah. Copy. Sorry, this is on the fly. My slide was missing. And then I'll unhide the thing. So, what we've done with the help of our friends at Siemens is this was the original, this is a, a, um, an airflow system for cooling down our pens on 3D printing. It's originally like six parts. Our first attempt was to just integrate that into, into one and just print it as a, as, as a whole. And that's just to be cost competitive with the molding. But then we worked with our friends from Siemens and they did an optimization, a generative design, looking to optimize the flow and they were actually able to come up with a completely weird geometry that we would have never come up with. Uh, a human would have never come up with this. It has 22% per, airflow improvement versus this or this. And so in that case, the fact of the matter is if the only way to make this and we depend on that 22% flow, we'd be willing to pay a little bit more extra money for, uh, for that complexity, okay? So this is MJF complexity space where you would not even, uh, well, you can't print it. You literally can't mold that sort of geometry. All right, so there's another space here, which is complexity, which can't be molded. All right, now I was a program manager for hardware development for several years. And let me, let me kind of give you this guy's view. All right, very simple. When you're a program manager for hardware product development, you're always trying to balance scope, schedule, and resources. It's those three things. 
It's an optimization problem between scope, schedule, and resources, trying to get the optimum return on investment for your program. Now, scope is the functionality of your product, including the cost and quality of that product. The schedule, of course, is, is schedule. And then resources is the money that you spend either in people or investments. All right, so this is, this is how um, this kind of plays out for the, uh, for the program manager. I'm first gonna talk about cost and investments and then take the opportunity to correct some errors in the 3D printing business. And for those of you who have been following the 3D print business, you may be familiar with this, but let me explain it. The horizontal axis, again, is the quantity of parts that you're manufacturing. The vertical axis is what the 3D print industry has called total cost per part. And so what the 3D print industry argues is, look, if you're gonna make one part from a mold and the mold costs $20,000 or $50,000, well, if you're only gonna do one, the part costs $50,001. Uh, but if you're going to do 50,000, you start to you start to asymptote. Okay, so they they paint that picture this way, and then the argument from the 3D print industry is that regardless of whether you're printing one or a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand, the cost of the 3D printed part is the same. That's the first fallacy. If you do not have quality requirements, that may be true. But if you have quality requirements, you at least have to set up quality inspection processes for that 3D print process, which is gonna cost uh, setting up the CNC, uh, I mean the, the, um, the CMM, programming the CMM, getting a fixture to hold the part, you'll at least have a setup cost. And so there's no such thing as a flat line unless you don't have quality. If you don't have quality, maybe this is true. Now, the second problem with this curve is that if you have a process which has bad productivity divided by acquisition cost, the fact of the matter is if, for example, you have, uh, you pretend to make these parts out of laser centering and you can only make 2000 parts a year with a $300,000 machine, if you have a production volume of 10,000, you have to buy five $300,000 machines. And the fact of the matter is the curve for that bad productivity divided acquisition cost looks something like this. You might as well make a mold. Now, the worst part of this whole analog to digital break even curve is what I'm gonna be talking about in a bit, which is the hybrid supply chain. It pretends like you have to choose between one and the other. And the fact of the matter is you shouldn't be choosing between one and the other. And the fact of the matter is this is not the way people generally do accounting. So let me talk about how program managers, at least in enterprise businesses, generally do accounting. The way we generally do accounting is there's program investment, and that's what we use to calculate our ROI. And then once the product is in production, there's the product cost, which is part of the PNL. Okay, and we don't normally trade one off for the other. They're independent decisions, and very oftentimes independent people worried about them. You know, so in this 3D print business, what they're, what they're trying to argue with this analog to digital curve is that, look, a mold costs a lot of money, although the injection molding cost part is very cheap and the 3D print cost is 10 times that, but you should accept that because you don't have to pay for tooling. Okay, my product has to be competitive with the com competition. If I have, to charge 10 times more money for my BMW Model 3, how am I gonna compete with the Mercedes C-Class? This, 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 this is a ridiculous argument. The truth of the matter is there is development cost in 3D printing, which I just talked about. If you have to invest a little bit in tuning your process, it's not the same investment as, um, as a hard tool, but it does take you some time and some engineering but then you drop the cost over here. If you can have your engineer follow the rules of thumb for a given process, you improve quality. If you can have that engineer take some material out, you improve the cost. If you can have that engineer change, here's an example of batching. If this were square, you could only fit so many in a batch. 
If you could put a slight angle, you can put more in a batch. So if you can design the part so that more can be uh, produced in the batch, you drop the cost further. And then finally, um, there's the integration of parts, in which case you're not comparing the cost of this part versus one part, you're comparing the cost of this part versus several parts. This is the way that people do accounting. This is the way uh, that, that you generally would look at things. Now, what you see is on the left-hand side, there is some development cost, but that can help you bring down the cost of that 3D printed part and be competitive. Now, the fact of the matter, and this is why I wanna talk about hybrid supply chain, is that with the exception of these very complex geometries, almost all the time, your production volumes are such that it's going to make sense to invest in a mold for any process, including MJF, okay? So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. The truth of the matter is if you're, if you're building tens of thousands, it will make financial sense to invest in a mold, except for these complex geometries. So this is the introduction then of the hybrid supply chain. And what I want to talk about first from a program manager perspective, how he looks at schedule versus investments. All right. So you guys, you're going to find that I like frames. All right. So the vertical axis is investments. And I'm showing that as negative because you're investing and investing, investing. Now, what ha happens in hardware product development is that each phase of the, of the product development costs more and more money. You invest in tools, you invest in assembly lines, you have the manufacturing team working, you have a factory, okay? And so each phase you're investing more and more and more until you go into production, in which case you stop paying for tooling, you stop paying for the investment in the assembly line. And so you kind of stabilize to a, a part of the, the cost of manufacturing. And then you start selling the product through the useful product life, okay? Now I'm showing this like it's shown because this then would be the return. This is the investment, right? Now what happens when you're close to introducing a product and you have a problem? Well, you keep on investing about at the same rate. You don't go back down to zero. And so for a program manager, he's spending a lot of money if he's getting a slight schedule slip. Now, for those of you who have not done program management, some people say, well, that's okay. You just lose the ramp, right? No, what you lose is the useful product life, the competitive life of your product. My competitors are not standing still while I'm delaying my product. All right, and so the truth of the matter is if you did your return over investment again at this point, you probably would say it doesn't make sense. But then you start playing games with sunk cost and you say, well, rather than start over, it makes sense to keep on going, blah, blah, blah. So what 3D printing and hybrid will allow you to do is keep this on track. And this is what I'm gonna be talking about in the following, in the following. And here's where we start talking about hybrid supply chains, not one versus the other, how you use both digital processes and analog processes to optimize the money across the whole product life cycle, not one versus the other, but how do you use both across the full supply chain? So back to the product life cycle. The 3D life cycle is shown here. The fact of the matter is the only real difference is the development time. The investigation time would be the same. The development time would be much shorter with a 3D, uh, with a 3D life cycle. Now, if you could do all 3D printed parts in a product, and that's not realistic, but if you could, then uh, the fact of the matter is you save a lot of money. You save the investment here, you get faster time to market, you introduce the product sooner, but then when you get to the end of life and you need to support, you need to support um, the obsolete product in the field, the fact of the matter is you put a lot less money in inventory, all right? So what I've kind of shown at the bottom here is a more comp, this is not the analog to digital conversion, it's more complicated supply chain. What you would get if you could do this is the profit of this additional life, the lack of investment in tooling, uh, less cash and spare part inventory, no scrap at the end of inventory, and then 
maybe you need to subtract if that part costs any more than this. Now, the fact of the matter is the, you, what you could do then is take some of this money and iterate more frequently. Now, the fact of the matter is this is, this is oversimplified view because very few products in the world can be 100% 3D printed. All right, so more realistically, what happens is that you have some parts that it makes sense to 3D print and many parts where you continue the mold. All right, now what would happen in this case is you can develop, you can do more iterations. You have less investment for these 3D printed parts. You have higher quality because you've done more iterations. You've got higher performing product and and then in the end, you have much less cash and in inventory for those 3D printed parts. So again, the gain is shown here down at the bottom. It's not a, simpli it's not a simplified um, analog to digital conversion. It's more complicated supply chain calculation over the whole life of that product. Now, let's talk about that hybrid because that's what we wanted to talk about. If you are having problems with a given subsystem, and you couldn't introduce your product because of that subsystem, the fact of the matter is you ought to think about what we call bridge manufacturing. Now in bridge manufacturing, this is, this is how it looks. Up here at the top, you deal with those problems and you iterate fast with 3D printing. You go into production with 3D printing when the design is stable. At that same time, you start to launch the tool. When that tool is ready, you switch production to, the, uh, to the, the mold because it's less expensive parts. And then at the end of life, you support that. Now, what you end up doing is saving some money here because you, in, you in fact, uh, instead of slipping your schedule, you stay on track. You know? So this costs you a double validation. You validated this and you validated this and you've proven that the two are equal, okay? But what it does is save you this uh, very critical competitive life of your product. Now, there's other reasons why you might do bridge manufacturing. The following is a real scenario. So in here I've switched. Up at the top is the injection molded. Those three chevrons are the same 10 to 20 weeks that I've shown before. You start production. You find a catastrophic problem in the, in the field. What do you do if you have a catastrophic problem in the field? You have to stop selling the product until you solve it. You have to deal with the escalations. You have to deal with the, uh, with, with the, the, the cost of those escalations. What you can do is bridge, find a solution with 3D, get back into production as soon as possible. When that design, is, and this could be as little as a week or two, when that design is stable, launch the tool. When that tool is ready, go back to production with the tool. This is hybrid manufacturing in the simple form. Now there's one more scenario where you may use bridge manufacturing and this is a bridging in the field example. The other example is in particular in the current situation of you know, kind of economic hardship you may delay investment in tooling, not because of technical reasons, but because you have run out of money this fiscal year. So one way around that is to actually start with the 3D printing of some parts. And then once probably you're in the next fiscal year, you're ready, you invest in that tool, et cetera. Now, here's where it starts to get more complex. And here's where I really get into hybrid manufacturing. If you're going to qualify this and qualify this and pay for this double validation, why would you do end of life support with molding? End of life support, let me explain how, how we do end of life support in, in HP. End of life support is we're gonna obsolete a product. The mold is gonna be put on a shelf. If we need to support that product for five or 10 years, we calculate how many parts we're gonna need in spare parts inventory over the next five or 10 years. We make those parts with the mold, we put those parts in inventory and we put the mold on a shelf. The cost of spare parts and in inventory for molded parts is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I'm talking about uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for most products. 
um, in high volume manufacturing like, like, like we do. This is actually the real justification for double validation is something like this. If you're gonna validate and validate, the fact of the matter is when you get to the end of production, end of life should be a file. It should not be parts waiting in inventory in case they eventually fail and eventually throwing a bunch of those parts away because they were never used because you, you were conservative in your, in your estimations. This is actually, if you look at the money that's stuck in cash, in spare parts inventory, end of life, that's the real justification for this double validation. Now, here's the most complicated one. And this one uh, it requires a level of supply chain management that, uh, that's more sophisticated than, uh, than maybe most people are accustomed to. But it may make sense in some cases to do a double validation to prove that this 3D printed version and this molded version are the same and to do the stable production or what they call push supply chain with molding and do the upside production or the pull supply chain with 3D printing. If these two designs are truly equivalent, you can do that. If you've paid for that validation, this is then the, the real complex optimization of hybrid supply chain is shown in this, is shown in this graph. Now, this is not easy, okay? I, I think that conceptually people haven't thought through this um, uh, as, as, as much uh, as they could because we've oversimplified the analog to digital conversion. So HP, now we're dealing, um, we're working with the supply chain management school at Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. We're trying to put these more complex supply chain models uh, into a simulation that we will eventually turn into a tool that people can use to make these more complex uh, supply chain decisions. Um, and so, you know, I'm not pretending to say this is easy. What I'm pretending to say is this is the optimum use of money across the entire product life cycle. All right. Now, then, how does this come into play with the with the current situation? Well, the current situation with with the COVID, of course. Uh, Everybody uh, has heard the, the medical uh, industry is suffering, lack of parts here, lack of parts there, lack of solutions, um, lack of protection, personal protective uh, devices. Um, we've taken these, this value of 3D printing uh, of this flexible supply chain faster to market. And what we're, we're starting to do then is apply it to um, the current situation in uh, in the medical industry. Now, what, what we've done in 3D uh, print organization in HP is we've started a website um, where um, people can, not just us, but, but others, they can upload uh, qualified designs to our website. Um, and what, what this website then uh, does is as people qualify designs, um, we are allowing for the download of certain uh, designs for free. And so it doesn't matter whether you're going to use a, a MJF, an HP MJF printer or something else. You can download the, those designs for free, print them out. Um, an example is these face masks in, in the United States, you actually, they actually tie around the back of the head. But the Chinese version... Um, they tie around the back of the, of the uh, medical practitioner's ears. And what happens is after a full day of, uh, of wearing these things, um, your ear starts to get tired. And so this is a really simple, uh, simple design done by one of our partners in China uh, to help relieve the, the, you know, the pain in the ears here. And this is one of those uh, files that's available on, on our website. Now, what happened in Europe is that the European masks, of course, they were tied around like the United States, but then they started to run out of masks and China sent them a bunch of masks with this ear problem. And so again, these are being now used also, also in Europe. Now, what we're doing also in HP is that for hospitals, um, there's, uh, if you know people in the medical industry, uh, somebody can, uh, a hospital can kind of tick on this website and if you scroll all the way down, um, there's hospital requests. So 
what we're trying to do is if there's a request from a hospital, we're trying to provide those, uh, those designs for free, okay? Not just the designs, but the parts. An example of time to market um, are these, these personal protective equipment, these face masks that, that surgeons use uh, when they're going into production. Now, this is a little bit more complex than, um, than the, the other example. This actually has functionality um, that, and there is a regulation around it. Just to give you an example of how fast you can go into, into production. On a Saturday, um, our team in Barcelona met with some uh, the medical team from San Paulo uh, in Barcelona, um, the doctor explained the requirements of the, of the mask. By um, Sunday, we printed out this, the first version. Monday morning, the doctor was trying it out. Uh, Monday afternoon, we had the second iteration. By the end of the week, we're in production um, in Barcelona for the local hospitals in Barcelona. Uh, and um, in San Diego for the local hospitals in San Diego. And then several of our, uh, of our customers who have 3D printers from, uh, from HP, including some that you would say, you know, who, who why? And they, you know, they're just trying to help the community. Lamborghini is printing for hospitals in, uh, in Italy. Smile Direct, of course, I think it was in CNN. Um, Avid up in uh, up in the Bay Area is, is printing for the, the Bay Area. These two are, are French companies. And so what we've done, um, you can think, uh, you can think, I said COVID is a worldwide issue. This is not a local issue. The solution was developed locally, but you need to scale it across the world. How you scale across the world with digital processes is the distribution of the tool, if you will, or the distribution of the part is digital. The fabrication is local. And this is the advantage of one, fast time to market, and two, being able to distribute around the world with, with a, a worldwide supply chain. Now, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, we're all trying to do what we can to help the, the medical industry right now. Uh, you know, some people call this uh, World War III, and it's the world against the virus, and uh, the practitioners are. They're the front line and they need weapons. So another thing that we're doing on that website and in HP is we've got um, what we call the digital manufacturing network. And here's where I, where I introduce uh, our friends at, at GoProto. Um, there's a handful of customers of HP products that have proven the ability to manufacture with quality. They have the capacity um, and this network of providers is, is actually available uh, for use for scaling some of these local solutions around the world. Um, and one of our partners, and you know, if you're interested, you can kind of go into that QR code and, and figure that out, or even go on to our website. One of our partners, and I'll take the opportunity to introduce is uh, GoProto. Um, their headquarters uh, down here in, uh, over here on the, on the West Coast, they've got a, production facility here in San Diego in my backyard. Um, they are actually a provider of not just additive manufacturing parts, but uh, tooling, molded tooling, sheet metal parts. Um, and they they themselves have some facilities in, uh, in Australia and um, they are one of the founding members of this uh, digital manufacturing network. And then let me, now take the opportunity to uh, introduce Mr. Jesse Lay from, uh, from GoProto, who will talk about some of his use cases and um, how they're using this, this uh, digital manufacturing to, uh, to uh, bring products faster to the market. Jesse. Thank you, Ed. Uh, quick sound check, can you hear me? Can everyone hear? Yes. Great, thank you, Deborah, I appreciate it. Um, so thank you, Ed. Appreciate the uh, the introduction. Thanks for all the valuable information. Very helpful to understand about the the hybrid supply chain. Um, we are here to talk about um, GoProto being, as, as Ed mentioned at the beginning of his talk, a, a direct part manufacturer. We at GoProto manufacture parts from initial concept, industrial design models, all the way through production, it's getting some weird video artifacts here, all the way through production. As, as Ed uh, graphed there, you've got 
um, the 3D printing on the, the left side of his chart all the way to the, uh, to the high volume production on the far right. And we encompass that entire scope. So just a little bit about kind of who we are and then we will uh, be talking about uh, some use cases. So you can really see, all right, how are we, how are we doing this? What's, what can we actually expect from additive manufacturing in the practical sense? So a quick snapshot of, of who we are. We're a, we're a group of uh, very passionate industry veterans. We've all been in this, this industry for a long time. This is a, an industry that has changed around a lot, which has meant um, people kind of come or companies coming and going and merging together. And, and we're a fairly young company, but very long history in the market uh, from back from when, when parts were done uh, directly from 2D prints that we had to had to cut in sections and and uh, fax over to our factories and um, and then stereolithography was introduced all the way to today where we've got some incredibly capable 3D printing technologies which are able to actually make as Ed Graft the the uh, end use production parts. So a big part of our value is this end to end solution uh, manufacturing that we provide that really gives us the opportunity to look at projects and. Um, give customers the, the the real truth and a whole bunch of different options if if necessary to take them all the way through this this continuum from uh, early life to end of life as again as Ed Graft there um, something that's very important about who are we and why are you listening to us what do you what are we here to say is this complete quality approach additive is a tool that needs to be used smartly and in the right application to get to achieve the uh, results that you want. It requires a company, if you're going to be using additive for production or for higher quantities um, or for sale parts, you really need to be working with a partner that is able to understand the, the complete quality uh, required that in includes everything from upfront analysis of your, of your design through manufacturing, solution for manufacturing, as well as an inspection and a plan for inspection, which a lot of complex parts require um, some, some unique approaches to, to inspection because they're not just straight set them on a, on a um, inspection table and, and measure XYZ. They're, they can be a lot more complex than that. So we at GoProto have been working in injection molding. We've been working in machining, rapid uh, sheet metal for years, and we're able to apply all of our inspection and, and all of the, the um, quality plan around those techniques to additive manufacturing and 3D printing. Um, we have manufacturing operations, as Ed mentioned, in US. In the US, um, we have our location in San Diego, which is my virtual background here. It kind of keeps coming out for some reason. Uh, that's our factory there in San Diego. We've got uh, the HP MultiJet Fusion printers in the back. We've also got um, Stratasys FDM machines as well as 3D Systems SLA. We offer machining rapid injection tooling and, and sheet metal. Um, are those, some of that is done at our facilities in Asia. And then Ed mentioned our location in Australia where we also have the multi-jet fusion printers. So we're a good example of a direct part manufacturer with distributed locations. So we're able to help match uh, customer needs with our location capabilities to help minimize cost, maximize speed. And of course, as Ed mentioned, the digital manufacturing network, we're a, a key partner. There's only, I think, six companies worldwide now. Uh, we're one of the early foundation partners. We've worked really closely with HP to, uh, to show that we are going to be able to, to take a customer's part and produce it in multi-jet fusion at standards that they need, that they expect every single time. And that uh, requires a, a very high level of understanding of the process, a great level of engineering, and uh, and on into production and fulfillment that is going to meet the the needs of the client and, and then stability of the company. So we're yeah. in business for for one reason, and that's to to solve quick turn on demand custom manufacturing problems. We're here to solve it. So we're a very consultative company and work closely uh, with companies. Um, all right, next shot. Thanks, Ed. Um, this slide just shows our, our services just in brief, um, just quick, quick kind of rundown of, of everything from concept models up in the upper left down to finishing uh, down below. And this, this continuum of, of ideation through production. So we do, we approach product development like artists. So, you know, we understand that we are going to need to represent a client's design quite well. Um, we don't want to be taking their, their, beautiful designs and using manufacturing techniques that don't match. And so we end up with, 
with parts that are say ugly or don't have the right uh, the manufacturing technique to make them look like they're supposed to. So we understand where you're going to be coming from, from that early ideation all the way through production. So we're able to use each one of these tools that we have mapped out to help you achieve your various uh, stages of your product development. So we're full service. This is just a quick snapshot. You can see these machines here are what I'm uh, uh, right in front of. This is our location. We are brick and mortar. We have our own machines. We care about our people. We understand what it takes to, to make parts. We're not just sourcing them. We're not another uh, continuum or another consortium of uh, manufacturers. We actually make our own parts. All right, so then something else that's very important uh, to understand, uh, kind of back to what I was talking about with ideation, is that you print parts, that's that's one thing. They come out, they look, um, multi-jet fusion parts, for example, look like in the vapor smoothing uh, uh, picture there and the, on the left side, that's a multi-jet fusion part that's just been tumbled. So from there, that's great. It's a very good start, nice clean part. But to make it applicable to your application, you may need to have some other cosmetic processes done to it to make it be a, a production capable part. So you take what would otherwise be an ideation early concept um, uh, part into production by sometimes applying graphics or um, colors or coatings like Cerakote that, that make parts UV stable, make parts resistant to chemicals, temperature, what have you. So we understand and we're full service all the way through this, uh, through the, each of these processes. All right, next slide, Ed. So we're going to just kind of go into case studies. You know, that's enough about uh, about GoProto, really. Um, what we wanted to, to talk about and show here were, I think we've got three case studies. And Ed, correct me, I think we've got about another 15 minutes or so of this, and we'll go into Q&A. Um, so we'll just, just talk through some of the case studies. This is an example of, of a customer that, that used this hybrid supply chain that uh, Ed was referring to um, to analyze his, his possible manufacturing technologies that he might employ. Uh, this this uh, gentleman, um, his name is Dirk Durham, Durambos that um, runs Rope's Edge. He is, as we'll see in the, the next slide, which I don't want to get to yet, he is the, uh, the, the subject matter expert. He is the designer of the product. He is the, the manufacturer of the product. And then he sells it and educates his customer and trains them on how to use it. So he's a great example of of someone who came up with an idea, there's no other product on the no product on the market that that meets the specs for what he's trying to to make, and so he creates his his own product and he's making it directly with additive manufacturing, and this is a really interesting and exciting application because this part requires a ton of strength. It's a very very um, demanding application, where. This rope, as you can see in the pictures on the right, what Rope's Edge does is they make um, devices that allow workers to hang from steel grating. Um, so on, say, oil rigs or in, um, in lots of different industrial applications, you know, there's a steel grating walkways that you'd walk through. To get underneath that is often very difficult. And what you end up having to do is put ropes down through it and then suspend a worker from a harness down below it. And usually what, what happens, of course, is you get a, a rope that is abrading on the, the hard, sharp edge of metal. And so his product here provides a, um, a wear surface that doesn't uh, degrade the rope so that you don't end up cutting it and having a worker fall. So that obviously is under a huge amount of strain. And this customer used the, the idea of hybrid. He, he understood all the different additive technologies. He understood and worked with us on, hey, let's quote machining, let's look at rapid injection tooling. Um, and he ended up coming back to additive manufacturing because as I say here, he didn't really consider it too far because he had these geometry constraints. He had pricing constraints. He did not want to invest in uh, injection tooling that was very uh, expensive and also locked him into a design. He had very quick lead time requirements and he wanted to be able to adjust his design in the future, potentially on the fly without having to have tool changes. So we stepped in and, and worked with them to, to analyze each of the, the possible technologies. We looked at um, using our two locations because he has a distrib distribution network in Australia and he wanted to, uh, to be able to produce parts there so that he didn't have to ship them across the ocean. So we, we printed parts here and we printed parts at our location in Australia. He's been, been uh, using them and they're both being part of the digital manufacturing network. We have to make sure that our quality is the same in both. It's kind of like a burger franchise. You wanna make sure you're getting the same quality at, at each location. 
and uh, it's worked out excellently. Um, something that's that's important to understand is this uh, part consolidation. And what we mean by that is kind of like Ed showed earlier in his airflow example, up in the picture in the upper right there on this slide, you'll see that there's a lockering that is uh, part of the uh, the assembly. And these parts are printed in assembly. So they, there is no, you don't have to have two different part numbers and keep track of them in inventory. They're locked together for life. And uh, then the part is is put down in uh, through the steel grating and then that lock ring locks it up uh, locks it up tight for its, uh, for its intended use. Um, so then lastly, a uh, price target is key. You know, he had this $44 price target for this whole assembly and we were able to hit that. And the great thing is that that, that means that he was able to make parts at a fairly low quantity on demand without any tooling at a $44 price target. So you look at, you know, you go through the pricing, like, all right, if I need to make a hundred of those, that's $4,400, I can get them in five days. And I've got a product that is is capable of being used in an aggressive mechanical load environment. It's an incredible story. Uh, let's go to that next slide Ed, that you were just on. So this is a, this is Dirk. And um, as he says there, this is a, a video we have that you can watch uh, later. It kind of uh, is difficult in the, in the uh, meeting environment here, but, he talks about that he's the director, he's the CEO, he's the worker, he's the engineer. He's a great example of how additive manufacturing democratizes the uh, the, the manufacturing to, to folks like him that maybe don't have the, the resources or the time to uh, to get a, a full product validation done with injection mold tooling. Instead, he's able to, to use additive manufacturing and then possibly look at going into the future into injection molding as he's able to sell uh, more products and, and be revenue positive. All right, let's move to the, to the next slide. So we've got another example here of, uh, of Flame Systems. This is an Australian company who makes uh, virtual reality firefighting systems, as you can see in the picture. This is a company that has traditionally been machining using you know, analog technologies, which we would probably help them with, um, like uh, machining and injection molding and, and potentially sheet metal. Multiple components, uh, takes, takes a while, sometimes can be expensive where they've ended up using additive. They've consolidated, consolidated all their parts, um, uh, which cuts lead time, cuts cost massively, and reduces a bunch of fasteners, helps reduce weight, and also increases strength. This thing has got um, some, some weight on the back to fully simulate, uh, to, to accurately simulate what a firefighter may be feeling as he or she is fighting a fire. And uh, this requires a, a high amount of, of strength, a lot of comfort, a lot of um, flexibility as the firefighter is moving around. Great example of how additive has, has made this uh, possible. There are also, as you can imagine, this is a pretty unique, um, that's okay, Ed, you can go to the next one. Um, this is a pretty unique uh, product. There are not tens of thousands of these things sold. There are a few, there might be hundreds. There might be something that they do for a particular fire department where there's five. And so they can they can manufacture using additive very cost effectively. And here uh, this this shows what what this is is a picture of the nested build. So the multi jet fusion is a cubic volume build. It's a powder bed technology. You're able to pack a lot of parts into the build. In these machines that are behind me here, um, they're pat they're packed into the build, and the the, the materials laid down layer by layer. The energy resources over at the drop and applied and you hear the part there by layer and the the exciting thing is here that we can nest them together consider it like a, a 3d uh game where we're able to to nest parts together and so you can get cost and and high productivity and we just wanted to show what that what that looks like build to build these systems including all of the components that they need for it so this would be what's called a, a kanban basket where we're, uh, we're building all the parts in, uh, in one, one basket. Let's go to that next slide, Ed. And what this shows is, uh, is an exciting reduction in the development cycle by using DFAN that's uh, designed for additive manufacturing. So this customer, we worked with them, they did kind of like Ed showed, we went back with them and, and had some, some design feedback on what they might do to optimize their design to make it manufacturable and additive and back on that uh, slide, which you don't need to go back to it, but the, the picture of the nested build, we were able to work with them to kind of modify some of their geometry so things fit together well. So we were able to make two, two builds. That reduces cost. That allows us to print two instead of say just one. We're able to reduce their overall uh, cycle. This is in weeks along the, the, um, the axis on the bottom there. Um, from you know approaching 25 weeks down, we cut off you know more than 10 
weeks in their development cycle, which as Ed showed in that earlier graph means that they're able to capture their, their target market sooner. They're able to, to have their, their product, their productive life of this product be increased. So this, not only did this just save them money, but it also um, uh, allowed them to capture more market share by being out in the market sooner. So we all know we're all shooting for in product development for, for quicker, um, design cycles and product introdu introduction cycles. And this shows really a very practical application that, that achieved exactly that. All right, let's look at this next one. Uh, we wanted to talk a bit today about the um, the, the fight for, for or the, the collective effort in fighting COVID and, and some, some practical applications that we've had here using multi-jet fusion. And, and um, so I've got a couple of case studies here. This one's an exciting one. Uh, this is uh, working with Seattle Children's Hospital in Seattle, Washington. And uh, they've got a case where they have uh, difficult parking and they have their, their parking lots a couple of miles away from the hospital because they're in downtown Seattle, which parking is very difficult. So they have this fleet of buses and the, uh, the, staff, the medical staff gets on and off the bus um, the bus driver is, is unprotected at that point or had been. And so they came to us looking for some, some possible solutions for them to be able to make a, a temporary barrier, may turn permanent, we'll see, so that as people come on and off the bus, passengers are sitting, they're not coughing, sneezing, uh, putting aerosol uh, in, into the air and infecting the driver. As we say, there, the, the drivers are often volunteers, they're often seniors, they're, they're high level or high risk uh, group here. And so what they did is they came to us and said, hey, we need, the, we need to have this, um, this shield put in place. Can you help us with it? And we worked with a local designer. We ourselves are not a design uh, uh, company. We, we generally manufacture parts. We work closely with a designer in Seattle and, and uh, ended up uh, being able to, to design this product very quickly, including what I have circled in red, which are the multi-jet fusion bracketry on this uh, thing that allowed us to, to install it into the bus. And you, know, you see there, they, they are um, parts that we would normally consider machining. And because of the durability, you know, it's something if someone comes walking up the stairs and, and loses their balance and falls into that shield, they're gonna need to, it's gonna need to not break. And so those, and also um, lots of vibration, as you can imagine the bus in traffic hitting potholes and so on. Um, it also, the, the plexiglass shield there is heavy. So those are some high, high physical demand parts and additive works beautifully for it using multi-jet fusion. We could also make those in fused deposition modeling, um, but they're a little slower, a little bit more expensive and, and they are a little bit more uh, isotropic in their properties so that they end up, um, end up being weaker in the Z. So what we wanted to talk about here was the time to produce this was just fascinating and, and exciting to be part of really. Um, in machining, which we do is very quick. We, we have huge capacity. We'd be looking at, at something like two to three weeks to be able to make the quantity that we talked here. But with additive, we we're able to make it in, in four days. So the client came to us, we worked with the designer. He had the designer the design done in two days. We then went into manufacturing. We printed, in, printed the, the client a batch of parts for them to test. And that was done in, in four days. So in six days, they had parts back assembled into their bus with no tooling cost. And then they were able to, to um, work on testing, which is where they are literally right now. And probably tomorrow they're expecting to have this uh, completed and be able to, to have us manufacture the rest of the parts to be able to, uh, to, to outfit their additional 20 buses in their fleet. A great example of just something that you maybe wouldn't have considered like, wow, I can add it, I can additively manufacture these parts and they're, they're going to work and they're going to help hopefully keep at least mo all of those bus drivers safe from, uh, from infection. Okay, and I think the, the next slide uh, we wanted to talk about, um, this is another uh, case that we're, that we're working on. Um, wanted to address, you know, these are, these are face masks that we're making, they're, they're respirator masks that we're 3D printing. What you're seeing in those pictures there is, is one on the left. The 3D printed portion is the gray face shield. And then underneath the green um, filter material is a, is a frame that the, the filter material uh, fits over and then we snap the frame in the filter frame into the main frame from behind there. So the 3D printed part is the, is the gray part in that picture. Um, these then can be worn over the face to, to protect the wearer from inhaling aerosols as well as uh, people that are around the wearer uh, in case he or she sneezes and, and um, spreads aerosol out into the environment. So this is something that we've stepped into. This was an open source design. 
um, that the community has has put out in place. And then we with our printers are able to, to step in and uh, work with those designs and get parts into manufacturing very, very quickly. We're able to fit uh, roughly 45 of these in every one of the, the builds. We have six machines back there. We're able to do two uh, builds per day. So we're able to manufacture a lot of these. Now, we we're talking we are talking in the context here hybrid manufacturing and of course these are medical products and need to understand need to work with the marketplace to to understand the needs for for medical manufacturing and what are the requirements you know we've carefully considered um what is what is required and and as uh ed again kind of talked about we're looking at, at parts that are primarily personal protective equipment that have kind of low fairly low functionality that have um, the ability to be used in in kind of a, a let's call it a, a wartime World War III time um, stopgap need to get something that is functional uh, in the hands of users so that they're protected. And um, these are not FDA grade, but the materials are, and the uh, the manufacturing methods are are um, traceable. Materials are traceable, and we're able to very quickly step in uh, as many of our of our brethren in the in the additive manufacturing and 3D printing space have done to use 3D printing to get parts out in the marketplace quickly to, to help with the, help fight the, fight this uh, gnarly disease that we're all faced with. So we've, uh, we've been, been manufacturing these. We wanted to, to look at this next slide here. This is a, an example of the, the testing and the uses that we've been, been doing with these face masks. Here in the photo, this is one of our uh, clients who is an anesthesiologist that has been using this mask uh, to help us test it to make sure that the, uh, that the ceiling works. Um, here in the right is our um, Eastern Regional Sales Director that was working through the, this uh, testing method where you, this is how these face masks are, are tested for um, sealing. So here there's a little, a little opening that a spritzer is, is installed in and the user is supposed to read a passage uh, while having this, this aerosol spritzed in here. And if he or she tastes any of the, the spritz, it's, it's kind of sweet salt. Um, if they taste any of it, uh, then, then you know that the sealing um, didn't work. And in this case, it has, it did work, it passed and has worked very well. So we've been manufacturing these just as a, um, in, in builds, in, in full basket builds made available to, to the clients on a, a quick uh, basis. So um, we talked, I just talked through here about the fact that this is a, a 3D printed part that is made from open source design. We are able to make the parts very quickly, low cost. We're able to make, depending on the size here, I said uh, 40, I think a minute or two ago, um, up to 50 per day per MJF printer. So this is something that, whether it be GoProto or other manufacturers with multi-jet fusion equipment, we can produce a lot of parts very quickly that are very usable. And here's an exciting thing is that it, the design can be modified. And we've actually been doing that with this particular design here. The airflow um, needed to be improved a little bit. So we're, we're expanding the, the rectangular sort of the square size there of the, the filter and we'll be making the, uh, that will make the airflow a little bit better. And that's something we can do on the design, on the fly rather with no design changes and uh, then be able to get back into manufacturing very, very quickly. So you can also, something that's important to consider with 3D printing and uh, didn't really talk about this earlier, but was the, the ability to, to make unmoldable features. So that has come up in some of these uh, masks, we have we have looked at it like, well, why not injection molded? And a lot of the times that is because, you know, these these features where the, the um, strapping is applied here can be d difficult to mold. Also, uh, some of the, the mask designs have got features where you say have a rubber band in place to trap the, the filter material. And some of those are undercut features, which would be very difficult and expensive to mold and also take potentially quite a long time. So we're able to use 3D printing to make um, these unmoldable features. Um, the idea here is is also that this is a, a reusable frame. So you you just reuse the frame, take the filter out, discard it, put a new filter, um, put it in place after say re-sterilizing that uh, the the frame parts, put it back together, and you're able to use it for the next shift. Um, also, these materials um, I talked about earlier, the regulatory requirements, the multi-jet fusion PA12 materials, biocompatible, and uh, Rojas compliant. So we know that these are going to be um, be able to be used in a in an environment where they're gonna be in contact with, with patients and skin and as well as the wearer. So I believe that's kind of uh, wraps up my portion of the presentation here. I believe we're gonna be going into a question and answer stage. Ed, are you able to take back? Uh, <clears throat> I think you can, you can hear me, right? Yep. 
All right, and I just want to mention there's uh, some websites here for people uh, who are interested in um, helping with the medical designs. You can you can touch here. Uh, GoProto, uh, thanks for joining us, Jesse. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, from here, uh, Jaime, why don't you go ahead and take it away for the question and answer? Uh, uh, Edward and uh, Jesse, uh, thank you very much for a very um, uh, interesting presentation. You know, for those of you with a knack of uh, uh, accounting and finance, uh, I can tell you uh, uh, Edward's uh, uh, presentation reminded me of a final exam of material balances during my chemical engineering years. Uh, I think that analysis like that should be required for every project. You know, thank you guys. Uh, the application is fantastic, you know, uh, Jesse. You know, and since uh, we're in these times talking about, you know, COVID-19 so much, you know, I, and while I wait for the audience to start, you know, uh, sending some questions, you know, we don't have a lot of time. We have another presenter at 11.30. So let me, let me start with the logistics, you know, questions about, you know, logistics, you know, particularly with this, you know, COVID-19, you know, I've heard everything about, uh, you know, spare parts for automobiles, bananas, flowers, I mean, you name it. Uh, uh, the uh, supply chains have been disrupted completely. How has this affected your own supply chain and how are you dealing with it? Uh, Jesse, you wanna, you wanna go or you want me to take this one? Sure, either way. Um, be happy to since I uh, kind of introduced it there. Um, with us, uh, our supply chain has, has been affected. Uh, there are, um, of course, you know, for the, again, for the machines behind me, we need powder. Uh, we need uh, the consumables, uh, which are the, the detailing and fusing agents. Uh, we need the material for our FDM machines. We need injection molding pellets for our, our, our molds um, in Asia. So it's been a very complex um, set of things that we need to check on. That said, we've, we're careful about this and we're always prepared for at least a couple of weeks, if not more, depending, you know, we're a just-in-time manufacturing kind of situation. Um, so we're always trying to keep our supplies able to handle us for at least a little while. And really, we've been, we've been um, quite, I, I don't want to say lucky because it's more than lucky. It, you know, we've been, we've, we've worked it out quite well that we haven't had um, any real major issues. And HP, for example, um, when things started um, kind of getting, let's say, we all became aware of the severity of the situation. HP has worked with us very, very closely to make sure that we have all of the material that we need. And it's, it's ended up working out really uh, very well. So really for us, the supply chain has been um, really pretty stable. I would say on the other side, our customers, we've worked hard to make sure that, that as a supplier to them, that we are um, being very, very proactive in our um, response, making sure they understand that we uh, treat our workers very carefully, but we're an essential business so that we're, we're here to, to help them um, through this difficult time. Our, we're not gonna disrupt their supply chain. We're gonna help them. Um, and we're gonna use, in the context of this conversation, we're gonna use some of our hybrid um, technologies to, to help them keep in supply. For example, we've had customers um, that have had a difficult time getting their injection molded parts out of Asia. And we've been able to come in and 3D print them parts that have worked um, to, to, to bridge the gap while they wait for their production tool to come online. So for us, it's, it has been a logistics juggle, but it's ended up working out quite well, um, both from our, from our supplier as well as being a continued supplier in the chain to our customers. Great. Uh, uh, let, me, let me follow up with another question re re regarding that. Um, in, in the health industry, you know, is very well known for regulations. You know, you got to go through all these hoops before a particular material is approved uh, for a particular purpose or application. How do you how do you deal with that? You know, with the with the current situation with COVID nineteen, can you just uh, uh, take a material that is still hasn't been approved, or you still you know you're limited to what is being approved and try to. Uh, uh, you know, consider it in the uh, molds or, or parts that you are printing. Yeah, can I take that one, Jeff? Yep, of course. <clears throat> well, yeah, first uh, material approval for, uh, for medical use um, is, is a prerequisite. Uh, I think there was, a, there was maybe a question on uh, whether our materials are, are um, medical grade. Yes, our nylon 12 is medical grade. Um, but let me let me comment on regulations a, a little bit from a mechanical engineering perspective. Um, what tends to happen with these regulations, these regulations are intentional uh, to slow things down and very 
specifically to assure uh, that the quality and the safety are um, are, uh, are are highly regarded uh, above and beyond uh, above and beyond schedule. But what tends to happen is that the more complex the design, the more functionality in the design, the tougher the regulation is because you have to test uh, a more complicated regulation. Let me let me use as an example this face mask. Um, this this surgical mask actually the the real functionality is uh, it's a splash guard. It's a splash guard that the that the um, uh, that the um, that the uh, medical practitioner is using. There's actually um, then three regulations. There's this. We're we're trying to get this tested over in in Europe and just give you an example of how difficult it is to to, to pass regulations. Um, those tests for uh, for for this part is there's three of them. Um, the first is you have to protect against splashes. All right, so that mostly has to do with the geometry that's shown here, and you know, have you done a good design on the on on the on the shield? That one we pass. Um, the second one is there's uh, impact resistance testing on the materials, and that one we pass with 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 lots and lots and lots of margin in our first designs. And then the third one, believe it or not, is an optical test, which, uh, which um, is, depends on the material itself that you use for, for the shield. Now, um, for fast time to market here, we were using PVC. And the fact of the matter is for this kind of, for, to pass this test, um, I think you probably have to use something like polycarbonate. So there's one test that we're still challenged with, uh, which is we don't pass the optical test. And the European Union, in this case, this is a European certification, is looking to, um, uh, to either change that regulation or to make an exception given the current situation. Uh, because quite honestly, you can see well through PVC. Uh, it's not like you have to you know, watch a 4K movie in, in high definition. So um, here's, here's an example of something as simple as a face mask actually has some challenging uh, mm -hmm. has some challenging regulations. Now, as you, as you get more complicated designs, and I want to mention this specifically, if you get more complicated functionality like these ventilators, one, the mechanism is complicated. This is not, this is not a respirator. It's a ventilator. It, it's assisted breathing. If you're trying to breathe out and the machine is breathing in, um, quite, quite honestly, this could as easily kill you as it could help you, you know. So there, so I'm I'm very cautious about these uh, open source uh, ventilators. Uh, it's a very serious uh, regulation that needs to be passed. The thing has to function as an assisted breathing, you know. So I'd be very cautious as you as you go from a scale of simple to complex mechanisms. The regulations become more uh, more challenging because of the the seriousness of the uh, of the device as well as the complexity of, of the device, you know, so we're, we're all here to help the, the medical practitioners, but, um, uh, you know, we, we've got to provide them with the right weapons and regulations are part of, are part of that, uh, are part of that solution. Yeah, great. Uh, uh for the two of you, uh, and, and perhaps more for Jesse, um, uh, along the lines of the supply uh, uh, chain uh, issues, what are your thoughts and learnings from COVID-19 for next year? Or, you know, hopefully we will not have a COVID-20 or something like that. But, but it is an open issue right now with uh, all the communities are, are thinking, you know, uh, that this was just, a, you know, and we're in the middle of it, you know, it was a you know, very heavy uh, warning call to all of us. Would this uh, uh, get your uh, companies to sit down and start thinking uh, along the supply uh, you know, uh, 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 chain, uh, how do we contend with this going forward if something like this ever happens again? Yes, absolutely. This is a wake up call really for, for everyone. And it, in some ways it, it has of course made us need to, uh, let's say create new ways of doing business. In other ways it's validated what we were already doing. For example, diversification of 
supply chain and our ability to or our need to be able to shift uh, manufacturing potentially as we all know you know things kind of started in Asia and we have ma major operations in Asia and then it headed over to the out to the rest of the world and eventually got to the US um, but then as the US has been afflicted China is actually or Asia has actually become uh, kind of come back online as we've kind of all probably read they've started to be lockdown is kind of being loosened up um, so we're able to kind of transition some of our manufacturing uh, basically back and forth as, as needed. And this gets to the very heart of what we're talking about here with hybrid manufacturing. And sometimes that means in, in a particular part, like Ed talked about, um, or Josh talked about earlier, that you might 3D print a part and then machine um, a portion of it to get the tolerance you need. So that's one way to view hybrid. But the other way is that you may actually need to combine your technologies where you start with, um, sorry for the video artifacts here, um, where you may start with a 3D printed part and go to an injection molded part, or you may also be working with injection molding and then for some reason your tool becomes unavailable and you may need to, to switch back to 3D printing to allow you to um, to get to stay productive. So our, our ability to kind of lay, just think about agility and the fact that you need to be able to shift around um, if, if necessary, this, this COVID situation has definitely made that possible. It's also, um, I wanna to speak to the digital manufacturing network um, here um, quickly. And that is something that HP to their tremendous credit has worked on um, very hard to make sure that not only is the network set up, but the members within the network are um, speaking together and are talking together. Yeah, you look at it, and I, I mean, we're we're good friends with the guys at, at Forecast and Prototol and and um, Zigzag and so on. And we've all we've spoken together and said, hey, um, you know, th these things. While these three D printers are very very capable, high volume um, machines, they are not able to produce hundreds of thousands per day, especially with just our machines that are behind me in the background here. We may need more than this, so we may need to rely on our partners to help, say, supply. St. Jude Hospital or Boston General or what, what have you. So that has, you know, that has forced us to kind of work together in a way that is not going to go back where we're going to be, you know, stronger partners, which is going to end up helping the whole user base and hopefully the world really. I mean, as digital manufacturing changes the way parts are made, knowing that a network is put together to help support them means that you're not just relying on GoProto, you're not just relying on ZigZag, you're, you're able to kind of tap into a, a network of folks who know one another and can work together to support you. Right, right. Uh, one last question, uh, you know, very quickly, uh, let's talk about intellectual property. Um, you know, there are conventional manufacturing processes that have patents in place, you know, for X or Y, uh, uh, you know, objects or processes. Would there be any IP challenges in the application of uh, additive manufacturing to produce parts, you know, conflicting with those patents that already exist? Certainly. Yeah. Ed, do you want to talk about that? It might be kind of a good. Uh, yeah. Are we talking about the parts themselves, Jaime, or the processes? The processes. The processes, uh, the processes of manufacture. Yeah, I mean, I can I can speak to that if you want to, because that is a, a thing. There, there's the idea that you could say like reverse engineer a part and put it on a 3D printer and 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 have have a product made pretty quickly without um, going through, you know, the the legal course. And that's something that that we're careful about. I mean, we we as a part manufacturer, as a direct part manufacturer, can really only produce what customers send us, and you know, we're not going out and searching and validating necessarily that every design hasn't been. Um, pulled from somewhere else. So there is a, there's a certain amount of risk, but um, we're careful. We can validate all the, the prints that we have. We keep records of everything so that if that ever comes up, we can show that we've, you know, that we've talked through it and um, have, are, are doing our best to make sure that, that nothing is, uh, is taken out of context and printed in an in a environment that's, that's not legal. Yeah. All right. There, Thank there, you very much. There, uh, there's, there's also some, some ability, <clears throat> I mean, that, um, that 3D printing has that you that you don't get from a, an injection mold very easily, which is um, it, it is possible to mark individual parts. And so we can not just trace to the exact lot, we can trace to the exact part. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is this is uh, in fact some of the, the safeguards that are being, being put in place uh, in the 3D print industry. And in particular, for a process like uh, like HPs, you could have 
what, what we call overt marks, visible marks, just like in, in molding, or we can hide marks within the part uh, by, by printing different dot patterns. And that's, that's extremely difficult to, to pirate. Um, uh, in fact, almost, almost impossible to pirate. Right. Um, and so there's some safeguards for 3D printing in particular, if you have um, a dot by dot process like, like the HPs. Okay. Very All right, gentlemen, uh, we're at the end of our time. So I, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of uh, Society of Plastic Engineers, I uh, want to thank you for contributing to the, you know, particularly the advance of our knowledge and you know, 3D printing. I think it's been a great presentation for all of you who are listening and, you know, uh, the contact information is in the slide. So, you know, you're welcome to reach out to Edward and, and Jesse. You know. So let's give you a round of applause. You know, uh, I have my uh, virtual uh, uh, applause <laughs> awesome. here. That's, that's three. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and for all of you who are